Before we bring out uh, some great panelists, I want to introduce uh, one of your directors. Give it up for Georgia Archer. Yay! Here and it's nice to be with friends. And we have some fabulous people here now. Tim, who's in the film. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, so why, don't we, why don't we bring up our panelists and we can take a few questions about the film and then you try to come on up and we can have you introduce yourself. And they're going to take this and then put it all sorts of places. <laughs> so if everyone wants to just uh, say a little bit who you are, a little bit about yourself, so people know what's up. AJ Glessman, I'm a legal fellow at the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU Law School. I'm the campaign director for Free Press, um, and we're a media reform internet rights group, and we did a lot of work with Rob helping him bring his case to the FCC. I'm Aaron Sinreich. I'm a media professor at Rutgers University. Yeah, Aaron. I've got a couple of students in the room. And I've been uh, covering basically music and the internet and civil liberties as a researcher since the mid 1990s. So uh, let, I'll start this out. So yesterday was actually a big day for net neutrality. Uh, does anyone want to take the lead, explain what happened yesterday, maybe kind of sum up where we're at on this issue? Sure. Thank um, you, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was meant for explaining. So, so you saw so it's, it's a little bit of history of what happened. So, so Rob, in 2008, took his case to the FCC, and he won on a 3-2 vote. Um, and um, interestingly, one of the two commissioners, Meredith Atwell Baker, who voted against net neutrality, ended up um, leaving the FCC and taking a job with, can you guess which company? Comcast. Okay. Comcast. Comcast. Yes. And, After uh, helping put the merger through. Which and actually, she actually versus. signed off on the merger of Comcast and NBC. Yes. So, so that case, actually, Comcast appealed that case, and you saw that they, 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 we actually lost uh, an appeal in a federal district uh, appeals court. Um, and the FCC went back and tried to redefine their authority. And at the end of last year, December 2010, they created an open internet rule that asserted the FCC's authority to do this. Well, people like Marsha Blackburn, the representative that you saw with the ax and the stick, didn't like that, and she introduced a resolution in the House to void the FCC's authority, pass the House, um, and uh, another senator from Texas, which is the home state of AT&T, um, introduced a, resolu a similar resolution in the Senate and yesterday... Well, you have went, to say the name, because it is the best name of any resolution. Uh, it's called the Resolution of Disapproval. <laughs> and it is a very arcane process under the Congressional Review Act that empowers Congress to void an agency ruling. And in this case, the FCC. That resolution, which went through the House, went to the Senate yesterday, oh, was voted on the floor. We got 98 of the 100 senators to vote on it. And we... That is, those of us who support net neutrality won. Right. Uh, 52 senators, who so happen to be all Democrats, voted against 46 other senators who just happen to be all Republicans, uh, and the resolution of disapproval was voided. Now we're going back to the courts. Verizon is, is challenging the ruling in the courts, so the saga of Rob, the saga of net neutrality. Uh, does anyone out there have any questions uh, in the back? Okay, so I know who's funding the anti-net neutrality side, you know, Verizon, Comcast, and so on. Who, who is putting up the money for these lawyers on our side? There's a lot of pro bono work, actually. Um, and it's organizations, some is traditional civil rights organizations like the ACLU. Some is uh, more kind of digital focused organizations like the EFF and the New America Foundation. But there are a lot of lawyers who are donating their time, both to big law firms and individual uh, solo practitioners, uh, under pro bono, which uh, all attorneys have to devote a certain number of hours per year to, um, to cases where they are, they're not going to be paid. 
I, I, I'll add oh. that in, in making the film, it was kind of funny because, well, it's not funny, um, it, it's my own and my, my filmmaking partner's savings accounts. And then we wandered into some grant money, but as we've been going down the road, when we were doing our Kickstarter, I had a couple people fully going, this is a Google-funded film, don't, don't support it, they have all this money. Oh yeah. oh yeah, yeah, it was crazy, and I was getting in these chat rooms and in a huge Twitter fight with someone. I was like, I wish I had Google money. I would be so okay with that, like, but I don't. So don't tell me I do because <laughs> it's just wrong. But it's it's yeah. I think a lot of people that are doing it are just doing it out of their own pockets. And I'm an NYU employee. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So is the is the solution ultimately like statutory, or is this always going to be litigated? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the ideal solution would be to get uh, Congress to uh, put an amendment to the Telecommunications Act that uh, that gives us net neutrality as law. Um, the the FCC also has the authority to revert. You saw the term common carriage. Yeah. Uh, which was the way that governed the telephone lines to revert internet access to a common carriage principle, which would effectively give us the same thing. Would that take legislation too? Uh, the FCC, the Supreme Court decided in 2005 that the FCC had the authority to make that decision. The current FCC, we have a, a Democratic FCC under uh, under Jen, Chairman Jenikowski, is timid, and they don't want to make that decision because the phone and cable companies have called that the nuclear option. The, the, the other point to make, though, is that there really is no resolution. right? This is an ongoing battle that's been happening since the dawn of the American Republic. In the 1870s, yes. uh, the federal government empowered uh, a private organization backed by the YMCA, as some of my students know, uh, to inspect uh, communications through the mail and to censor things like advertisements for birth control. And as we move into a kind of cloud wireless world, uh, you know. It's, it's already been established. Even, even if the FCC does have the power to uh, to, to limit uh, the, the kind of discriminatory practices that companies like Comcast do on the wired internet, it's already been established that they don't have it for the wireless internet. So ultimately, I'm of the opinion that the technology itself has to be the foundation where that space of freedom and independence is staked out, because ultimately, government will never be able to, to provide that for us. Awesome. Oh. You work on this video, though. Maybe add to that. Um, no, I'm, that's... That's <laughs> sufficient. <laughs> this is kind of an abstract question, but uh, I would answer, what do you think more powerful people owning the power of resources or information? By resources, I mean, like, fresh water, like, actual... Uh, well, you know, you know, Thomas Jefferson once said if he were to choose between a government with no newspapers or newspapers with no government, that he would choose the latter. Um, and a lot of people understand that to mean that you need information in order for a democracy to function. And, and, and we think about the First Amendment as, as the principle that protects newspapers. But what most people don't know is that the next sentence that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson wrote was that we also need to make newspapers available to all of the people and to make sure that they can read them. So our whole, the whole policy structure that has informed the media in the United States is based not only on this idea of openness, we need the First Amendment, it has to be open, but also on the notion of access. Everybody should have access to information in order for a democracy to function. So, so I, it's a long answer. I think you know information is very important if you're talking about you know, a, 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 you know, a country that can essentially feed itself, but, but needs to function as a democracy. Oh, yes, you sir. Um, as you know, it was Tim Wu who coined the phrase net neutrality. Did you try and get him in the movie, or how did that work? And uh, question two, um, Tim's, in his new book, uh, calls for like structural separation between content and uh, transport. Uh, do you think that's the way we have to go? We, we put out a lot of phone calls, and, and yes, we tried to reach Tim Wu. We, 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 just, we were starting originally to make a movie about what happens when you lose brick and mortar and, and kind of the impact to community 
when everyone goes online, like there's all these fabulous things that happen, but you also, like I was a kid that rode my bike to the record store and hung out and made friends and learned things. And I realized as the neighborhood, some people, it's the bookstore, but for me it was the record store. When the neighborhood record store goes away, you have more access to all sorts of interesting music online, but you don't have that like dude behind the counter going, yeah, you shouldn't buy that, that sucks, you need to try this. And, you know, make your friends. And so I was just kind of really thinking in terms of community, and that's where it started, as it went after the FCC hearing, which was amazing, and it went down the neutrality and open internet issues highway, we, we reached out to a lot of people. But, you know, this is my first film, and, um, I have enough credibility, but it was it was great for the people that came to the table and talked to us, but a lot of people just wouldn't. So that's how that happened on that aspect. So we tried. Structural separation. Uh, structural separation. <laughs> yes. Well, you can you can accomplish structural se separation through um, common carriage. Um, essentially, that is a means to accomplishing that. And the structural separation is this idea that you separate the content layer, the layer that, of information, from the delivery layer. And essentially, common carriage would accomplish that. And if we can get Congress or the FCC to create a common carriage rule, um, or say what's called, I don't want to bore you all, but it's called, what's called Title II of the Telecommunications <laughs> Act, um, uh, uh, then we can accomplish structural separation. For a time. I mean, the problem is that, you know, administrations come and go, but these big consolidated communications companies are here to stay. Uh, and, you know, we broke up uh, the, the phone company back in 1984 into all these regional bell companies, and like Terminator 2, they've been glomming back together, and now we're stuck with AT&T and Verizon again. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing the same thing with that media octopus that uh, Georgia was showing in the film where you know a handful six or seven major international media companies control every single outlet uh, that, can, that gives us 95% of the content uh, that we consume every day. Uh, so go ahead. All right. No, I was saying it's funny to turn too, but in making the film, it really did turn into like the what the fuck horror moment because I am not as versed as, as everyone else here is on the issue, but. Just in making the film, I was like, what do you mean I don't have privacy rights on, on the internet? What do you mean this doesn't follow me? I, I just had no idea certain laws and rules and regulations just didn't protect me. And you start talking to people that are very involved in the issue, and they're like, oh, that's old news. We all know about Verizon. I was like, I didn't know anything about this, and that might have been last year, but I think other people do need to know about this. And I think that's part of where we hit a wall or an an amazing gateway with this film. It's just that I didn't know a lot about these issues and in trying to make it, tried to communicate it in a way that somebody that was at my level could understand. So it's not an advanced neutrality 2.7, it's more like a 101 intro class, but it was it was horrifying as, as things were going forward. And, and there are so many times, I'm sure, when I'm talking to people, my jaw was just dropped, and they're they're reacting probably to the weird faces we're making during the interview. And like, uh, could I ask you a question? There are so many points of time in the film where these lobbyists and Congress people would say just these bald-faced, not only untruths, but like violations of basic logic directly to the camera, and, and that's what they're paid to do. But you know, I, I assume and you most were, of them had lawyers and press people and like there's a squad of people that accompany yeah. people into a room. I do think it's, you know, my, my filming bird Kristen's a girl, right. my camera woman is female, and I think we just went in with this girl gang and they were kind of like, hey, ladies, <laughs> this is how it is, and pat us on the head and they're practically handing us lollipops, walking out the door. So the more we were kind of like, wow, that's neat, tell us more. You know, it just, it was really, really amazing that that could work. Wow. But it was shocking, some of the things. So that, so that was a strategy for you, was just to kind of play dumb and shut up. We weren't even trying. We were really not, didn't know what was going on, but we were smart enough to know when that wasn't the whole truth. So we just kept going. And it's funny when you see the politicians talking about um, how this is, you know, you should really let business kind of figure it out and as if like business was kind of a stand-in for the good of society that the free market was going to be, was going to sort of rise all boats and that everybody was going to feel 
everybody was going to benefit from this, but um, part of the work that we do at my, at my organization is we sort of, we do these cost-benefit analyses of, um, you know, whether or not it is actually good for the consumer or good for society to do something. And what we discovered was that um, if the internet provides huge benefits to the consumer um, on sort of the simple idea that if uh, somebody spends an hour on the internet, chances are that they're deriving more enjoyment out of that than an hour of work. So, you know, there's a reason why they're playing on the internet at that moment instead of doing work, and it's because they're probably deriving more than $8 an hour, $20 an hour, $2 an hour, whatever it is that they're making, um, and that's why they're on the internet. So when you add up all of those recreational hours, um, at least from the work that we've done, uh, it comes out to be more than $5,000 per user per year, per year um, of uh, benefit that's derived by the consumer. So what we're really talking about is the ISPs wanting to try and capture some of that, uh, that utility that the, that the consumer is garnering from using the internet. Um, and I don't know, why should they get that? <laughs> you know, that seems like something the consumer should get to keep. All right, I think we have time for one more quick question. Yes, in the front. So, uh, I mean, I, I happen to know AJ, so I know what net neutrality is. But when I talk to people about it, my friends were like educated, and I'm like, net neutrality, and they're like, oh no, I don't want to lose the internet that I have. Like, I don't want the government to do anything to my internet. Um, and I'm like, no, but that's the whole point. Like, you know, that's the status quo is that we have neutrality. So my question to all of you, I guess, it's why I'm so appreciative of the film for like, you know, breaking this open and making it more accessible, but. How are you going to, if ultimately the, the solution is a congressional one, then if we're talking, you know, to the extent that this is things are democratic, then you would want voters to know about this issue and care about it. And so, how are you, how are you working that angle at all? Like this public Occupy the internet. Claim <laughs> <laughs> ownership and, and call that y'all are much more active on that. Now how are we educating people like, about the issue so yeah. that they can understand what's at stake? So you know we're like we're writing policy briefs and putting them out there and trying to talk to free press and you know that's you know that's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. we do we do a lot of uh, stumping. I mean, every one of us is, is on panels like this all the time and conferences and talks to the press and gives speeches and, and teach teaches classes and um, uh, there there are a number of groups out there. Free press is one of them that, that try to make these issues more comprehensible to, to lay people. And, uh, you know, we we try to tweet and, and blog and. and direct people to those kinds of resources all the time. One of, one of the things that was really fascinating about this fight was that we had, you know, when we got involved in this six, seven years ago when it really started percolating, percolating was we, were, we struggled with this, like how do we make people understand net neutrality is a horrible term, people don't really get it. Should we use internet freedom? Should we use, you know, we, were, we would have these messaging gurus come in and we all kind of confused ourselves and how we should approach this. But something interesting happened people started getting it. And it wasn't that we like created a fact sheet and started spreading them around, but people started doing videos. There's like there's a comedian called Ask a Ninja, who, oh. Eddie, you might know from, from LA, who's a writer out there and a comedian, and he just did this skit about what net neutrality has, and it was completely ridiculous. And it was, you know, as an organization that works on talking points, we were like, no, no, you should never use those talking points. But he delivered them in such a funny way, and he put it up on YouTube, and it's over a million views. So what was amazing about this is that people got it, and they used the internet to save net neutrality. So they like, it was kind of, it was very organic, because they were actually using the medium itself to spread the word, and if we are to succeed, people have to start doing more of that. Because it, it just demonstrates the principle. This is an open internet, isn't it great that all these people are speaking up and using the internet to do so? Uh, I have one uh, very promising data point, which is I fielded a big survey back in 2006 of US adults and asked them what their opinions were regarding these kinds of what I call configurable culture, new kinds of cultural ideas like mashups and remixes and all the kind of cool stuff that you see on YouTube and that people pass around on Facebook. And uh, we had a write-in response, and people gave us their opinions of what makes good and what makes bad. You know, well, it's okay if people aren't selling it, but if they sell it, then they need to get permission from the copyright holder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The concept that copyright is a flawed mechanism for determining what people should be allowed to do did not appear in the 2006 survey. I refielded exactly the same survey uh, last fall, 
at the end of 2010, and that was one of the biggest themes to emerge from everyday people's write-in responses. It's, you know, hey, there's something wrong. I want to participate in this stuff, and the system is, is stacked against me. And now that's about copyright. That's a separate but highly analogous issue to what George's film is about. But it's very clear to me as a researcher looking at the data that there is a silent groundswell of consumer concern about the tip scales against them having any power to participate in this emerging cultural form. And I think that's, you know, that, that appears in the Occupy Wall Street movement. And I think that's going to continue to, to bubble out. Well, and my last thing on this thing. And what's going to be awesome is that everyone here can go into the room next door and talk to everyone here about this issue some more. But what's been interesting for, for me has just been we've been invited to play in so many festivals in like Eastern European bloc and in Africa and it, it, places where people don't take communication rights for granted. And they seem to just kind of get it and, and get out and into the whole thing and, and that's been frustrating and interesting and that we just I wish more people here and then trying to find a way to access that could get more engaged and understand you can't take your communication rights for granted. I, I have no idea, again I go back into that common carriage phone, cell phone, not following me. That's just fucked up. So <laughs> I, I, but I think that affects every single one of us in this room. And we don't we, we just take it for granted we have these these rights that we don't, and I, I think it's just that question of authority and pushback, and really everybody needs to take ownership of their rights as a citizen and, and kind of case what's going on around them. And, and maybe it'll take an extra 20 minutes in your day, but what an important 20 minutes! It's, it's 20 minutes. It's about your civil rights. So.